Hello everyone and welcome to PNP Live. My name is Heidi and I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator at Politics and Prose and I have the pleasure of hosting our event this evening. Thank you for joining us and tuning into this format where we continue to bring authors and new books to you. I am so pleased to welcome our guests this evening, Michaela Ulmer and Alelia Bundles. You can click the link we will drop into the chat to get your own copy of Michaela's new book, Be Fearless, Dream Like a Kid. Signed book plates are available. If you have a question for our guests, you can click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and add one there. At the end of the chat, our guests will have time to answer some of your questions. You can also vote on questions you like and want most answered. Now onto the event you're waiting for. Michaela Ulmer is the founder and CEO of Me and the Bees Lemonade. Using her great granny Helen's flaxseed honey lemonade recipe, Michaela launched her business from her home in Austin, Texas in 2009. After landing a deal with Damon John on Shark Tank, her lemonade is now sold in grocery stores across the country. In 2018, Michaela launched her Healthy High Foundation and a portion of the profits from her sales of the lemonade go to saving our honeybees. Alelia Bundles is an award-winning journalist, news producer, author, and the founder of the Madam Walker Family Archives. She is the great-great-granddaughter of the first Black self-made female millionaire, Madam C.J. Walker. She wrote On Her Own Ground, The Life and Times of Madam C.J. Walker, and was the nonfiction source for the Netflix series Self-Made. And now I will turn the event over to them. Thank you very much, Heidi. And hello, Michaela. It's Hi. wonderful to see you. Love your hair. Thank you so much. You both had this thing going on up at the top. I know. I have my 4C puff and you have your beautiful, it's like a twist. It's a twist. It's a twist. So congratulations, Ms. Author. Um, <laughs> so we first met several years ago when you were being honored by Walker's Legacy, an organization that was founded by Natalie Cofield. Um, to inspire women entrepreneurs and girls who are entrepreneurs. And that was um, inspired by the legacy of my great, great grandmother. So I'm always happy to talk to an entrepreneur, especially someone who's only 15 and already doing it. So listen, I know that you have told this story many times about your encounter with a bee that has led to this very successful business. But for people who haven't yet read your book, can you share a little bit about how this came to happen? Yes, so it started with the two bee stings and it was in Austin, Texas. So I signed up in two fairs, one the Acton Business Fair and the other one was Austin Lemonade Day. And over the summer, I had to find a product to create and sell because what those events allow you to do is it allows kids to come up with a business idea and sell their product for a day or a couple of hours without needing a permit. And so I just decided to sign up for fun and I was trying to figure out what I was gonna sell. The first thing that happened was I got stung by two bees in one week. So one was in my ear, one was on my neck. It was pretty painful. Have you gotten stung by a bee? Uh, yes, but it's been a long time ago. I was at a music concert and it was on my finger. Oh, so no. it wasn't that bad, not the ear. Uh. <laughs> I know, but I, I was thinking that I would probably get stung by bees for a while after that. Like I thought that was normal. So I was afraid of them. My parents said, do a little bit of research. And doing that research, I found out how incredibly important pollinators that they are. So like without them, we can't have a lot of the food but I also learned that they're dying at an alarming rate. And so I decided that whatever I do for this fair, I wanted to help save the bees. And it just so happened that I got a cookbook from my great granny Helen, and it was a flaxseed lemonade recipe. So I was like, I'm gonna take that. My dad helped me like blend it with honey and we made honey and flaxseed lemonade for the fair. Wow, so now how old were you when that happened? So I was four and a half when I signed up and did my first stand, but I actually made it official when I was around five because I had, I like made a budget, I had a stand, I had my bee suit. So I think the first round was more of a test round. So listen, a lot of kids have lemonade stands. That's, uh, you know, sort of standard when you want to have something to do when you're bored in the summer. But you really took it to another level. When did you realize that you had something more than just a kid's lemonade stand? Um, there, there are a couple instances. So one thing that's interesting is that at the fairs, there are awards. 
and some awards are for the most creative, some is for most likely to be successful. I never won any awards until I was about around seven and I got most creative lemonade. And then around that same time, a store in Austin said, hey, do you mind teaching kids at the store about the bees? Mm. And so that's probably when I started realizing, hey, maybe this is a little bit more because I'm saving the bees. And like, I also got an award for having a creative product. Well, so and so you have combined this idea of having a successful business with also being a social entrepreneur, mm -hmm. and you have you want to do something more than just sell lemonade. You've tied it to the bees, but can you talk a bit about the Healthy High Foundation? Yes. So before there was the Healthy High Foundation, it was me donating a portion. And I made at the stands to organizations that were saving the bees. And like, even if I didn't make a profit, I would still donate to those organizations. And before I started doing that, I thought I had to choose between like saving the bees, which is something I'm super interested in, and also making, a, like running a successful lemonade stand. And so I learned that you could be both. You could be what's called a social entrepreneur, which is like a new term that I learned. And I could save bees and like big money at my stand. And so that's what I did. I started with exchanging facts about the bees. People would like live, leave me tips. I have this like little antidote where someone late, didn't have enough for a bottle of lemonade or a cup of lemonade, but they left me a tip for the bees. And that's how I started. And so recently in 2016, I wanted to do a little, little bit more. So I was already teaching workshops with like my trifolds and I was already like the name was Bee Sweet and Me and the Bees more recently, but I wanted to do a little bit more to help save the bees. And so someone reached out, said, hey, would you be interested in doing a nonprofit? And they said, we can like set up the 501c3 and you can do what you want to do most, which is figuring out how you can save them. And so the Healthy Hive was born and we came up with like three topics, which was saving the bees through research, so finding out why they're dying, how we can save them, what are like different reasons why they're dying. Education, so teaching people, because there's still some people who don't know the importance of bees, and then also protection. So actually going out and changing regular land into bee friendly land. And it's been really fun. And it's the organization as well as Eliminate is still growing. And I'm trying to prove that you can do both and do good in the world, have a social cause, but also have a successful business. So when you're talking, especially with young people, what is it, are you seeing that you're able to really raise their awareness? Are there some examples where you know that you've made a difference already? Um, there are, and this is, this is one thing that I like to do is I like to ask people, like, was there anything that really clicked or was there anything that you really enjoyed learning? Or like, give me one thing that you remember or that you've learned. And just the amount of things or comments that I get back are so different. It's not all the same thing. So there's a bunch of different comments that I get back. But one was that like someone didn't know, this was at a bee workshop when I was talking about the bees, someone didn't know that honeybees only sting out of self-defense because like when they sting, they die. And so that's one reason to be like kinder to the bees. And I was like, I didn't realize that. I didn't think of that, but yes, that's a really good point. Sometimes when I talk about entrepreneurship and about starting an idea and making a budget and like finance and marketing, someone said an idea is like really out of nothing. Like you, you don't, you don't have to base your idea off of something. You, you can come up with ideas based on what you're interested in. It doesn't have to be like this big, huge business. It's just an idea. And that was something that I thought was pretty interesting too is that an idea is an idea. It's like the queen hive of your business. So um, you, I mean, that sort of makes me think of a quote that comes early in your book where you quote Nelson Mandela and you say, um, it always seems impossible until it's done. So it right. sounds like that really resonated with you. Yes, it does. Um, so in the reason why I chose this quote, we had, we had a couple different quotes, but I ultimately went with, it always seems impossible until it's done. There's a couple reasons. So when I say be fearless, I've said be fearless, believe in the impossible and dream like a kid. And also I say that no one ever thinks that a kid can change the world with a lemonade stand. Like it seems kind of impossible. And so what my business is, 
it kind of shows that it's been done. It seemed impossible, but it's been done. So that's one thing. But another thing was that I actually got to travel to South Africa. And this was for an event called like Dell Women Entrepreneur Network. And we went through a museum. We learned about the apartheid. And I just, I saw a lot of interesting facts about him. And he became pretty interesting to me. So that's why I decided to have a quote by him. And also his quote about generations changing the world. So we're going to talk about some of the really fun things that have happened, um, Hollywood and Shark Tank. But you've also had some real adult issues. So very early on, there was a, a trademark name title that you had to deal with. Tell me about yeah. that. Yes. So this was after Shark Tank, after I landed to deal with Mr. Damon. And like stores were reaching out. It was my first time on national television. And like the business was growing, it was booming. I like to say it was buzzing off the shelves. And I remember I, my parents, after they put my younger brother Jacob to bed, they said that they wanted to have a talk. And they eventually said, there's a company out there with a name similar to yours that wants you to change your name. And I remember being pretty angry. My name at the time was Be Sweet. And if some of you have seen the Shark Tank episode, from when I was nine and the stand was called B-Suite. That's what, that's what the name was for the other company. But they had started before minded and we did some research and learned, okay, so they may actually be able to force us to change the name. And so we were given two options. One was like fight back, we're gonna keep this name. And then the other one was just change it. And at the beginning, I was like, I'm gonna keep this name no matter what. I didn't copy, I didn't know about this business and B Suite is like the name that I came up with. And so my we started looking for lawyers. I, I had been stung by bees before, but I had never been stung by lawyers. And so <laughs> we were looking for ways to keep the name. And it was just getting so expensive and something that was out of our small business budget. And so my dad said, okay, sometimes, said this to me, sometimes you have to lose the battle to win the war. I was confused. I was lost. I'm like, why would you want to lose in the first place? But he said that he, he brought to my attention that you said you want to expand the business. So you want to do like skincare or snacks or things like that. And we know that the current name doesn't allow us to do so. So what if we take this name and use it as a way to like one, have the lemonade, but also branch it out. And so that kind of changed my view on things. I learned while I was presenting it at an agency in California, I shared with them my dilemma and they taught me a lesson. They said, it's not always just the product you sell, but the story you tell. And so I realized that no matter what comes outside the bottle, it's still gonna be me and the bees and my business and the same product. So just make sure that the story I tell with the lemonade and the branding still says that. And so that's how be, me and the bees was born. Well, I mean, it's the ultimate making lemonade out of lemons. <laughs> yes. Yes. And hopefully we can still do skincare and snacks because I'm waiting on that. Well, I, I did get the lovely gift from you with the uh, lip gloss. So I see you're already um, expanding. What are some of the other things that you do want to do? Or can, maybe you can't talk about those quite yet because they're corporate secrets sometimes. You know, I think starting with the lip balms and maybe going into soaps could be cool because I think that there's a lot of room for there. But I have the lip balms. These are them, if you haven't seen them, these are the lip balms. And so they're in multiple flavors too. So the lemonade has like prickly pear, half enough iced tea, and just a bunch of fun flavors. And then this one has fun flavors too. So I like that they kind of match, not exactly the same flavors, but they kind of match. Um, I think one way that I'd like to expand is having like a different packaging because currently it's in glass, but maybe cans or something. So it's available at schools because mm. they don't really want glass because they can break and it's also a school. So that would be interesting so I could sell it in cafeterias. But as far as other products, I'm working with the book, which is new, and I'm working with the lemonade. Now, one thing that's on the side of the Healthy Hive and nonprofit is plantable pencils. So they are pencils with instead of erasers at the end, it's actually a little bit of dirt and a, some bee friendly seeds. So when you're done with the pencil, it turns to a stub, you can plant it and they grow. Wow. And that's pretty fun. 
I love that. I love that. Well, in the book, you have lots of tips, lots of business ideas. So on one page, you say, consider these practices as you grow your business. Give, save, spend mm -hmm. in that order. So can you mm -hmm. talk about that formula? Yes. So it started with my dad. And you know, at the, at the beginning, him telling me to give, save, spin, I'm like, no, I want to spin right now and maybe <laughs> save later. Thank you. But he explained that give, save, and spin was something that his grandfather taught him. And it was like, here's what you should do. You should give a little first to whatever you're interested about, whether it's church or homeless. For me, it was the bees. You should save for something that you may not be able to buy now, but always like planning for the future. And so he had me list some things that I want to save for, and then you can spend. So put aside a little bit now to spend. And that's one thing that he, my dad does finance. And so I've learned how to make a budget from him. I learned how to give, save and spend. And then later I learned like income statements and balance sheets. But I think that's, I always say give, save and spend with your money. And I, I say it in that order. Um, because it's it's something that I learned, something that I know works, and I think it, I don't know, it keeps you mindful. Well, you know, I, when I think about what you're doing, some of the things that you've already accomplished are things that Madam C.J. Walker was learning uh, and passing on to other people. And so she would say, first, you have to have a great product. So check, you have yeah. done that. Uh, then you have to market it uh, and advertise it. Check, you've done that. Uh, then you need to give back to your community. You already have a nonprofit and your philanthropy is, uh, is at work. But when you mention your father, it also reminds me that one of, I think, the keys to her success is that she surrounded herself with really talented people. She had a great lawyer, uh, F.B. Ransom, who was able to give her great ideas, make sure that the T's were crossed and the I's were dotted. But it was this sort of community of both family and friends and colleagues. And it sounds like you have created that sort of network and matrix of friends. Your dad, it sounds like your dad is really key. So talk to me about family members being involved. And then we can talk a bit about your friends as well. But let's start with family. Okay, we'll start with family. Um, me and the Beads is a family run business. And I, at least what I've seen when it comes to business, you can't, you can't do it alone. And it started with my parents telling me, hey, do a little bit of research on the bees instead of being afraid of them. Or when I came to them and said, I want to figure out how I can bottle it, instead of saying, no, no way, or uh, not now, said, okay, how are you going to do that? And let's go like, visit some stores and learn more about it together. So, I mean, even in the beginning, when I was first starting out my business, they were very supportive. But since then, my mom brought her marketing expertise. So she had a marketing firm and she came to do marketing and help me market my business, help share and spread the word about my company. And then my dad helps with ops. And one thing that I love is that we all have like B related names. So my mom's chief marketing B, my brother is head of photography. Your yeah, brother Jacob, my dad is like chief worker bee. I don't know why he named himself that, but it really is like my family is the basis of my hive. And so then from there, once we started to grow, my parents started getting their hands full. My hands were full with school and then also the lemonade. And we realized we need a team. We started with a, um, we started with brokers to go out into the stores and make sure that the product was doing well. And we went to a sales team to go pitch the product. And then we added operations to make sure that the product is being produced on time and all the ingredients are ready. And so, yeah, just have an amazing team because I'm a student and a 15 year old kid and an author, like I, I can't do it alone. No, and absolutely. But you also have girlfriends who, uh, who help out. So talk to me about the importance of friends when you are, you need extra support or you need moral support? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, I think you, you already explained it. They, they provide laughs and moral support and advice on things that like you may not have, you may not have known you needed advice on, but they're going to give you their advice on it. 
and just like someone to talk to. And so I have, I think I have some amazing friends and um, I'm really glad some of them I've known since I was in kindergarten and first grade. Some of them I've recently met in high school. Others are other like entrepreneurs that I've met at like conferences and meetings and things like that. And so I'm really excited that I'm able to surround myself with such amazing people. So you and Oprah have good friends and and maybe one day you're going to have a big house in Hawaii or somewhere where everybody mm -hmm. gets to come. <laughs> so listen, I love your chapter titles, From Stings to Wings and The Hive Mentality. But let's talk about From Austin to Hollywood. So you mentioned having to take a few days off from school and having to keep a big secret. Yes. So I call it From Austin to Hollywood because that was my Shark Tank experience. Shark Tank is filmed at like Universal, Universal, Universal Studios. And this was kind of my first time going out into a studio and it was Hollywood. And so one thing that was really important is that you can't tell as a business who's going to pitch, you can't tell that you're going to be on Shark Tank. So when we were going through the rounds of auditions, we couldn't tell people other than like friends and peers who were helping us with our pitch. But I couldn't tell my friends at school. And I kind of had to keep it a secret until the episode aired and then there was this big reveal and people were like, I knew it, I knew it all along. I knew why you were smiling the whole show. But um yes, it was it was kind of hard. I may have like snuck a couple people and told them because I was in middle school. So I don't know if I was the best at keeping secrets. But um there was I think that's something that's interesting about the Shark Tank process and some other shows too. So then there's another title, From Shark Tank to the White House. Now, that's a big leap, too. Mm -hmm. What was so that, that was, visit like? That was from, that was when I was invited to visit the White House for the first time. Miss Michelle Obama invited me to attend the Kids State Dinner. And I was amazed because I know who Miss Michelle Obama is. And the fact that she had heard of me and my company was, in my opinion, amazing. And so... I was invited there. I got to shake hands with the president, take a photo. Me and my mom took a photo with um, the first lady. And then we were invited back for the White House Easter egg roll to sample my product to, I think it was like 3.5 thousand kids and families. And then I was invited again to introduce him. And this wasn't actually at the White House. This was at the United States of Women Conference. But I was able to introduce him. And that's where the whole be fearless and dream like a kid came from. It started from that. It was kind of inspired by that speech and what I came up with when preparing that speech. So we are about halfway through. And I know that we want to get some uh, questions from the audience. So Heidi is going to come back on and tell us what questions we're, we're seeing from the audience. Absolutely. Thank you both for that amazing conversation. It's just I love hearing all of this, but the people on the Zoom meeting are very excited that you are here and they have some great questions. So we're going to start from the top. Actually, the first one is a comment. It is from Betty B. And she says, what a beautiful young lady. I'm so thankful for your spirit. Yes, me too. I have purchased your lemonade and definitely plan to order the book for my niece as well as myself. So thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. The next question is from Jay Hagler and he asks, what would you, so a friend, um, yes. <laughs> what, would you, what would you consider your greatest success to date? Um, greatest success to date. I don't know. I, I think, I don't know. I think it's, and rather than successes, because I don't, I don't really use the term like successes. I use more of experiences and like experiences that I remember. So I guess my greatest success slash experience has been being able to travel to meet other people and see new perspectives, but also share my story. And the one that's probably most memorable was going to South Africa and Singapore. They were both for the same events, but just different years and meeting girls that I probably wouldn't have been able to meet and interact with and then teach them about financial responsibility. That's one of them. And then another one is just growing this business. That's pretty, that's pretty, I guess, successful. Yeah, and you have so much more ahead of you too. That's really exciting. Can I add one more? 
course. So as of the end of last year, we made, we had sold 1 million bottles. So that's a pretty big milestone for me. That's amazing. Congratulations. Okay. Um, the next question is from Karen Leggett. She asks, what was the hardest part of starting your business? Perhaps a time when you thought it really wouldn't work. Hmm. Um, the hardest part for, for the hardest part of me growing my business was probably a couple years ago. I don't remember. It, it kind of gets all blended together. But there was one point in time where we were growing in publicity and awareness. So more people were hearing about the company, but internally we had an issue with production. Like we, there was a time where we couldn't make enough lemonade and we were having to find like a building that that was small enough because you're still a small business and we are still a small business that was small enough to produce it, but big enough to allow us to stay there and make the lemonade for a while so we wouldn't have to go change again and so it was a time where we couldn't send out lemonade to stores and it was pretty stressful because that year was just or it was more of the that six months but that six months was a hard time it was kind of like the business was frozen for a little bit and i know a lot of businesses are experiencing that now because of COVID. it's a time where maybe you can't produce or you can't open up your shops or doors and it was it forced us to adapt, but also make a plan where if anything like that happened again in the future, we were prepared. Great. Yeah, I remember that part of the book. I think it's really helpful to talk about your successes and the things you struggle with. I think that's really helpful. Um, okay, from Katie G. She says, hi, Michaela. What do you say to people who are afraid of bees or maybe little kids that have been stung before? What do you tell them when they tell you that? Um, I... I mean, for me, what worked was learning more about them and like figuring out exactly where that fear comes from. And sometimes that means reluctantly looking up picture books or animated videos about them, but learning more about them. And I think sometimes that makes you a little less afraid of them. Uh, some people go like the extra mile and go put on a suit and go into the hives, which I've actually done. And I think it's pretty fun, but that was after I grew out of my fear of them. But I would start with learning more about them. And then also, there's some bees that don't sting. There's over 20,000 species of bees. There's some bees that are really docile and they don't look like bees. They're not black and yellow and striped, but they still pollinate and they're still in the bee category. So if you want to be uh, less afraid of the stinging bees, I think it would be really cool to um, start taking care of the like wild and native bees. And so you can literally create your own mason beehive and you want to make sure that it's a good one that's actually like clean for the bees but you get to go interact with those and they're really docile they'll still help your gardens they look pretty cool and i don't know you get used to being around bees that's a great idea i love it and you said that you you have your own garden that you're you're growing yes i have my own garden my squirrels are not my squirrels my mom's not a fan of them, but we have squirrels that were taking the tomatoes. I think it was the squirrels. We don't know who the culprit was, but I'm currently changing it now and adding, I'm going to be adding a bunch of new like pollinator friendly flowers. So yeah. Awesome. Great. Let's see. The next question is from Julie, Julie Curland. She asks, what age range would you say should be reading your book? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Looks there like you know. she got, um, looks like she got. Okay. So my book. There we go. Awesome. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Perfect. So that's a good question. My book, when I was figuring out what a, there was a whole process where you had to figure out who, what's this book going to be about? What's it for? Is it going to be like a graphic novel, a picture book for like little, little kids? Or is it going to be a long full text memoir for like adults with advanced vocabulary? And so the reason why we went with middle school is because we can make it fun. We can like they're old enough where I can teach. How, here's how you can come up with an idea. Here's how you can make a budget for your idea and like set goals. But also I can incorporate my story and how I grew so that if you're older and want to learn more about my business, it's still a fun read too. And based on the reviews that I've gotten in the blurbs, there like there have been adults who have really enjoyed it and kids who enjoyed it too. So I'm happy that I could make a book that like is enjoyable to both. Yeah. 
It's very inspiring. I loved it. I read it a couple weeks ago and I told my daughter all about it. <laughs> okay. Uh, the next question is also from Katie. Uh, if you could go back in time, would you do anything differently when you were setting up your business? Hmm. Um, no, not, I mean, not that I can think of. I, I mean, yeah, but I, that's probably one where I'd have to look back on, maybe I can find something. Not that I can think of. Yeah. You're doing a pretty good know. job. That's <laughs> a good question though. I just can't <laughs> think of an answer no. right now. You're doing great. Let's see. Um, this is from Molly Robinson. She would like to know, are your friends on the Zoom? So I'm not sure. Ex I don't know the exact participants, but um, the person named Jay Heigler, he is mm -hmm. my godfather, so I guess he's considered a friend and he works with me. And then, it paused for a second, but yes, this is Jay Heigler, hello. And for the, if you have a question and I know you, then I'll like say hello too. Awesome, thank you. Uh, we have a couple comments here. Um, this is from Timothy M. Nolan. He just says, hi, Michaela and Alilia. So, hello. Hi, Timothy. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Malice De Silva says, I have been following your story since Shark Tank. You are an inspiration to me as a parent and to my daughter. So proud of you. Mm -hmm. What an honor to be on a Zoom call with both of you. Really well, nice. thank you for attending. And I'm happy to say that there's one person who has like seen me on Shark Tank. So that was a long time ago. <laughs> Let's see. It uh, looks like the next question is from a teacher. Uh, Ron Bitzer says, if you visit LA, consider the Inglewood Environmental Charter Middle School for a visit. Tashandra okay. Jones, so we can send this information to you. Tashandra okay. Jones serves as a contact. Actually, that's kind of a segue into a question. Are you planning on doing any uh, virtual school visits with your new book? I think that that's yes you know i i know schools especially my school right now is having a hard time like transitioning to online and digital so if i'm going to go speak and do virtual school visits it's going to be a little bit more into the school year but that's something that i'd love to do and actually one thing that i've been working on this summer is making a workbook that goes along with the book and mm -hmm. so it actually has spaces for you to it's so fun and it has spaces for you i'm very proud of it but it has spaces for you to write out that idea and different activities like honey hunting and a bunch of options of where you can sell your product like here's let's go look at different business fairs in your area would you sell it on instagram um so that's something where if i do go and teach virtual classes or workshops about the book i would also include the workbook so kids can kind of follow along that's awesome that's a great idea uh, let's see. Malice De Silva also says, um, give, save, spend. They teach that in Girl Scouts too. So I, I had the opportunity to get Girl, Track, or Girl, Girl Scouts a couple of times and that was pretty fun. Nice. Let's see. Uh, Jessica Butler asks, uh, tell us more about the book writing process. What was your favorite part? Um, my favorite part, hello, my favorite part was probably like getting in contact with family, friends, and like people who like I haven't talked to in a while just to get the story straight. Cause you know, some of it, I don't remember. Some of them, my parents don't have the details straight. So that was one of the hardest parts is making sure that the timeline was right. And um, I'm sure Ms. Olivia, you probably know as well is just researching contacts and, and making sure that the story is correct. For mine, it was a little bit more recently, but that was pretty fun too, because we got to find images of me delivering to Whole Foods and stores in my cart that we didn't have, but now we could put in the book. Uh, Karen Leith asks, what about a first grader reading your book? That that work? I think so. I think, it, yeah, of course. And, you know, even if the thing about this book is that you can, like, read different parts, too. So if you, like, highlight a part or sticky note it or underline words that you don't know, then you can always go back and read it when you have a little bit more understanding. But definitely, I would so recommend reading this book. 
Yeah. One, one of the other questions was about Girl Scouts. So I know we have some Girl Scout friends on here. So I think that's something you can use in Girl Scout troops. And, you know, it's just, there's so many great pieces of it. You can just start planting those seeds in kids head really early. Yes. And, and did you hear my last answer? Yeah. Okay. I'm reaching out the mic. It's fine. Alilia, did you hear her? I, I heard did. It. I, you know what? And I see that uh, I think Michaela's mother has put a picture of her uh, with the bees and she's dressed up. So that looks like kind of a scary fun moment. I don't know if others can see that. <laughs> um, I think enough. one thing that's interesting is that about going out into the hives is that it's and also a little scary is all the different buzzes that you hear because actually each and this is unique to honeybees but mm -hmm. each honeybee has a different pitch buzz and so mm -hmm. Like when you're going out and visiting the hives, you hear all these different buzzes. It's kind of intimidating, but it's also pretty cool. That is a great segue into a question from Nancy Gubin. She says, uh, that this is from Ollie. He, wants, he or she wants to know, what is your favorite bee? Hmm. Hmm. No, I, I'm going to say Rusty Patch Bumblebee because they're endangered and they look super, super cute. But I think there's, there's a lot of like really cute ones that are super fuzzy and super fat. And I think they're pretty cute. I love it. Uh, probably, I think we have time for maybe two more questions. Um, Amy Neubauer says, uh, this is from her daughter. How did you convince people to initially buy your product? So that's a good question because I, at the beginning when I was selling out of my lemonade stand, I was nervous. I was nervous when to go tell people to, I was nervous to say like, lemonade anyone, here's my lemonade, because I was nervous that they were gonna say no. And then also when I started, when I bottled my product and I was looking for stores, it was also kind of nerve wracking going and talking about my business to like store owners and convincing them to carry the product. But one thing that I started with was I always said like, hello, would you like to try some honey sweet lemonade? So figure out what the main points or your favorite parts of the business are, because you can talk about those parts with customers. And for me, it was honey sweet and lemonade. I donated a portion to help save the bees. And I started it when I was at four. And also there's flaxseed. So the main points about your product, and then usually they'll ask questions. Sometimes it's a no, and you and you gotta accept that. Sometimes they'll explain why it was a no, and you'd be like, oh, okay. Like they don't drink sugar. Maybe I can make a sugar-free lemonade. That's something that like we've had to think of is just making sure that we know why customers are saying no. But that was how. It was figuring out what I loved about my product and I would talk about that first. That's a great life lesson. Awesome. Okay. All right. I think this is our last question. I'm sad to have to end. Um, Sabrina Getty asks, how do you balance all that you do? School, business, social life. What do you do for fun? <laughs> Okay, hello, Auntie Sabrina. Um, <laughs> so you probably already know what I do for fun, but I really en I enjoy reading. That's what I've done a lot of this summer, and gardening. So we talked about that a little bit. I rollerblade like every day. So I'll go. You got to go find the smooth roads in Austin, but sometimes it's like a mile. Sometimes I stay in a parking lot and do tricks, but that's something that I do every day. And sometimes it's like playing video games with my cousin or my brother and having fun time there. And then for friends, like going to parks or gardens right now because we can't do anything inside, but just finding some sort of way and time that I can like keep in touch and, you know, talk with them. That's a great, awesome. Well, I'm sorry we don't have time to ask more questions. There were definitely some more questions in there for people, but I know this is the start of your new book and there's gonna be able to see you other places. So best of luck with that. But I do wanna ask both of you, we, we do have the privilege of asking the last question is what have the both of you been reading this summer? Okay, so <laughs> you wanna start? Well, I um, just finished, or I have just started Eddie Glaude's book on um, James Baldwin. Mm -hmm. And I recently read Sarah Broom's book, The Yellow House, which I love. Mm -hmm. And I actually was at Politics and Prose on Saturday picking up a copy of Cast, 
Uh, and I looked around and there were a whole lot of other books that I wanted to buy, but I did, I only picked up the, the book that I, that I was picking up, <laughs> that I had listened to the conversation, the wonderful conversation from the other night. Thank right. you. So I have been reading, oh, my most recent one was Living Lively by Haley Thomas. And that's like a cookbook and then also some like mindful advice and then I read The Fever King by Victoria Lee which I thought was interesting because it was before the coronavirus pandemic hit but it's all about like pandemic it was a pandemic book but also like sci-fi and the government so that was really good and then Crime and Punishment which took the majority of summer <laughs> and, <laughs> and Scythe by uh, Neil Schusterman Scythe and Thunderhead so a little bit of young adult and a little bit of I think adult, but they were all really good. Very well-rounded. And can I add one more thing? Of course. So I know Politics and Prose is in DC, actually right down the street from Miss Alalia, but <laughs> if you- My in, neighborhood bookstore. <laughs> I know, it's nice to have a neighborhood bookstore. And if you live in DC, there's also, my product's also in all the Whole Foods in the DMV area. So if you wanna try the product or haven't yet, you can get it there and there's like each flavor of the lemonade. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Well, unfortunately that is all the time we have for, for tonight. Many, many thanks to Michaela and Alilia. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your stories. Um, Michaela, Michaela, we wish you the best of luck with your book and with your business in the bees. Thank you. Um, don't forget, you can still click the link in the chat box to get your copy of Be Fearless. And you can follow our Children and Teens Department on social media. The handle is posted in the chat. And you can also watch past events um, on our Politics and Prose YouTube page. So thank again, you. thank you so, so much. We really enjoyed having you both here. Thank you. Thank you. And if you have any questions, yeah, thank bye. you. If there are any questions that I missed, then you can follow us both on socials. So I would love to answer any of those or discuss further with the book on Michaela's Bees. Awesome. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks.